video, we'll discuss the cost concepts in the break-even analysis. So this analysis, the break-even analysis, will be very helpful, especially for new entrepreneurs in how to analyze their a production and as well as the sales and how to earn profit okay so at the end of this lesson you will be able to number one understand the nature and characteristics of cost classify costs according to their relation to the production as well as separation of course apply the break-even formula in computing target or budgeted sales and finally to explore the break-even formula and its various applications. So if you're ready, let's start. So you might be asking, what is a cost? And I know this term is really familiar to you already. Okay, so you have the idea or background already or what a cost means. This means something you spend on, right? You eat on a restaurant, then that's a cost, an expense report. If you buy something, that's a cost also. If you're in business and you pay something, that's a cost. Okay, so our basic notion of cost, what you understood of the cost, is actually the same of mine. Anyway, so in business, we have this concept that the profit is always equal to the sales minus the costs. Okay, this is the very basic and simple formula on how to compute the profit when you want to know how much the, your profit you just deduct the costs from your sales then you have a profit okay however there are certain items or certain things that you should remember when it comes to these three terms okay number one when you say profit this means this is your desired return for example if i have a business and then I would put up, let's say, 1,000 pesos, and I want to earn 200 pesos, then that desire, that return you desired is actually the profit, okay? And when we say sales, this is the amount of money received and earned in selling goods. So you cannot earn something without doing anything, right? You cannot earn a profit without selling of course you must sell something so you can earn profit how would you say that uh, you are earning profit if you don't sell anything right okay so when we say sales or sale this is the total amount that you received or to be received the amount to be received when you sell something so for example if i have this product let's say i have this product a mouse and i'd sell this for 100 pesos then that is the sale that is the price okay if i had many items of this then the sales could be computed as the price of this product and the total quantity sold right that's the sales the sales is the price times the quantity sold but when we say sales that is not yet the profit that is just the gross amount you received. Because somehow, when you, you know, before you sell this thing, before you had this thing, you spent on something, right? You spent on purchasing this, and that is the cost. So when we say cost, this is the amount of money needed to acquire the goods for sale. So, if you are in a merchandising business or retailing business, you are into buy and sell, okay, you purchase something at a lower amount, then you sell this same thing at a higher price. So, for example, again, let's say mouse. So, let's say I purchased this for 80 pesos, and then I would sell this for 150 pesos. So, the 80 pesos there is the amount that I spent to acquire, to purchase this thing. And that is the cost. Okay? And when I sell this thing to other to my customers at a higher price, that amount that I would receive is actually the sale. The gross amount. If I deduct 
the gross at uh, the, the costs from the gross amount of sales, then I would get a profit. Okay, so that would be 150 the sales minus 80 pesos, then I have a profit of 70 pesos. Okay, that's it. That's how you basically understand how to compute a profit. Okay. So again, when we say sales, this is computed as the price per unit times the unit sold. So when you have, you know, not just one quantity, but you have more than one quantity, let's say 10 or 100 or thousands, when you sell more, you got to earn more, right? The price might be the same, okay? The price might be, you know, constant for a certain quantity or might give discounts, but the more you sell something, the more you would earn in terms of volume of money, okay? If I have sold one of these and I got 70 pesos as my profit, if I sell two of these, then I will get 140 pesos, right? How about if I sell 10 units of this, then I get 700 pesos. So the more I sell this, the more I get more profit, okay? So, okay, so now let's focus on the costs, okay? Because this is basically our topic for today, the costs. Because when you understand how cost works and then its nature and how costs relate to your operation, you might have the best or better strategy on improving your profit. A lot of businessmen have failed to, you know, earn profit because they focus on the sale. They focus on the profit. But they forget to somehow look on the cost. Okay, so it's actually a wrong mindset because it is the cost which will actually give you flexibility in earning profit. If you can manipulate your costs, if you can actually reduce your costs and you can sell more, then that will be the time that you would earn a better profit. So that's why in this video, we will focus on the cost. So costs are the sum of money spent to acquire or produce and sell a unit of goods for sale. So it's said the amount spent to acquire to acquire if you are engaged in buying and selling or merchandising business where you will not actually manufacture your own product so that's to acquire when you say to produce if it's you who would actually be the one to make your own product and sell these products okay so it's not just about to acquire or to produce, but also to sell. So when we say costs, it's actually the total sum you spent from the time you acquire these products to the point of selling these products. So that defines costs. For example, if we have this pizza, assume this circle is the pizza. And then, of course, for pizza, we need a dough, right? We need a meat. We need pineapple. I know you won't agree with this or some people might not want pineapple on their pizzas, but I love pineapple on pizza. And then cheese. So cheesy. And then salt and pepper if, you know. Then packaging, of course. You can't sell a pizza without packaging, without a box, right? And of course, apart from these um, ingredients, these are the raw ingredients, we also need someone who will actually do the pizza thing, who will combine this together, these ingredients together, to make a one whole, you know, edible pizza. We need labor. We also need machines to cut, to cook, you know. And of course, we need utensils. You can't imagine doing pizza without a knife or without, you know, some utensils or plate. So you can't do that. And also we need a gas. Gas. Or LPG if you are cooking with, you know, the manual one. And we need electricity. Anyway, so these are the things needed to make a one whole pizza. Okay, so 
These are also the things that are considered as the costs of this pizza, of this one unit of pizza. Okay, so some of these things, the dough, the meat, the pineapple, some of them varies. You know, the more you produce pizza, the more you would you would acquire these things, the more you would need these things. But some of these um, costs also remain the same. For example, if one of your labor, one of your employee can make one pizza, you would pay him for 300, for example. If you can make two pizzas, still 300, right? It depends. Or if you are cutting, you know, you're using a knife, how, uh, it doesn't actually count on how many pizzas you have made, it's still the same knife. It, the cost will be the same. For example, if that knife costs you 50 pesos, and then the knife, that knife can actually make two pizzas or three pizzas, it's still the same one knife, right? It doesn't change. It's fixed. And so on. So in this point, we will classify which of these costs are actually considered as part of the of the of the pizza and which are not, you know. So you also need advertising because they have said to sell. And delivery, of course, if you're food panda, you know. So these are the things. So this dough, meat, pineapple, cheese, salt and pepper, packaging, these constitute our direct materials. They're considered as direct materials because they are the primary ingredients and they're the direct materials needed to create one pizza or a pizza, right? When you say direct materials, we can actually physically see these materials on the finished products. Okay, you can actually see the dough, the meat, all the salt and pepper. You can actually taste it. While on the, uh, on the other hand, the labor is the direct labor. These are the human resource. We are the, the, the amount we pay for our human resource. And these things, the machines, utensils used, the gas, and electricity, this is overhead. Okay, you might be asking, what's an overhead? There was actually a joke from my professor. It's called overhead because these things, the machines, utensils used in gas and electricity, they cannot be seen on the entire product. But you know in your head, over your head, that this cost actually exists in the making, the process. It's actually making sense because these overhead things, though it was a joke, um, we know that the machines, the sales are not physically there in the pizza. They are not there in the, you know, the complete pizza. But we know in our head that these things are needed to finish this pizza. Hence, overhead. Okay? So we also have this advertising. Um, the conversion costs is actually the sum of labor and overhead. So when we say labor alone, that's direct labor, and overhead alone, those machines, those are overhead. But when we combine labor and overhead together, we get the total conversion cost. Why conversion cost? Because these are the costs needed to convert these raw materials from being raw ingredients to one whole pizza. Okay, hence conversion cost. And when we say direct materials plus direct labor, this is the production cost. Okay, meanwhile, the advertising and the delivery are the selling, selling costs. Okay, so there we have the total overview of the cost. We have direct materials, we have direct labor, we have overhead, we have production costs, we have conversion costs, and selling costs. Okay? So, in summary, you have there the cost to produce plus the cost to sell. This is actually the definition of the costs. When we say costs, these are the amount you spent for the production and for the selling. 
of the goods or to acquire these goods and to sell these goods. This combined together are all costs. Cost to produce can be further divided into production costs, which actually is a, you know, a combination of direct materials and direct labor. And conversion costs, these are the costs that you need, you, are, you need to convert the raw materials into a finished product. Okay? So the production cost can be further divide, subdivided into direct materials and direct labor, while conversion costs can be subdivided into direct labor and overhead. So hence, there is a Venn diagram, you know, the intersection between production cost and conversion cost, there is one common of them, and that is direct labor. Okay? So that's it. While the cost to sell, these are the selling costs, and includes delivery charges and advertising fees. So that's the selling costs. Okay? So let's now classify cost according to their activity on the production. So there are levels of activity in the production that affects some costs. There are some costs which actually depends on how many uh, units that you are producing. Some costs would go high if your production would go high. So if you produce more, you would you would incur more. If you if you would make more of these, you will incur more of these, such as in making pizza. When you make more pizza, you would need more dough. Okay? Well, some um, costs are actually not that sensitive, regardless of how many pizza you're, you're making. That would be the same, like a knife. Whether you make two pizzas or eight pizzas or a dozen of pizzas, still you will need one knife, right? So costs which increases or decreases when the production level raises or drops is called variable costs. So when a cost varies on the production level, when it when it increases, when the production level also raises, and when the cost drops, when the production level decreases, then that is a variable cost because it varies from... Uh, it varies depending on the production level. Costs which remain the same regardless of production level is called the fixed cost. So there are a lot of costs which are also fixed. For example, when you are selling, um, <clears throat> let's say, merchandise and you have their, this warehouse and you are paying rent for that warehouse, Regardless of how much you would sell, regardless how many merchandise you could sell in a month, you'd pay the same rent, right? Whether you sell something, whether you sell zero or none, whether you sell hundreds or tons of your merchandise, the rent would still be the same. And that is a fixed cost. So let's now compare variable and fixed cost. So imagine this Cartesian or plane. Okay, so our x and y axis. So there are costs that increases when the production level also increases and decreases when the production level also decreases. And these costs are considered as variable costs because if you see here, when the production level increase, the cost also increase. But when the production drops, the cost also decrease. So hence, this is a variable cost. Okay? There are also costs which runs the same, which actually constant, regardless of how much you are producing or how much production level is now. So that's when the cost is constant, then that is a fixed cost. Okay, let's try this. Let us classify whether this cost is variable or not, or semi-variable, semi-fixed, okay? First, direct materials. What do you think? Is direct materials a variable or fixed cost? You're right. It is always 
a variable cost. How about labor? Okay, right. This is a variable cost, but sometimes it is fixed, depending again on the on the agreement, whether the the employee the labor is paid on fixed basis or in variable basis. But mostly direct labor is variable. How about overhead? Let's see if you are really listening. Okay, you're right. Actually, overhead is fixed. Okay, most of the overhead are fixed, but sometimes they are variable. There are overheads which are actually variable. So when I say overhead, these are the things that we cannot directly see on the physical product, but we know in our head, over our head, that these costs are there. So it can be variable sometimes, it can also be fixed most of the times. How about selling cost? Yes, it's usually fixed. It's for the advertising, marketing, delivery charges. Sometimes it's also it can also become variable, depending. Okay, so now let's proceed to break-even concept. So in this um, um, topic, we'll discuss on how you would earn profit. Okay, so again, when you say profit, this is computed as the profit equals sales minus cost. But that basic formula that profit is equal to sales minus cost is or may be extended further to include the cost, to include the category of the cost. So we can say profit is equal to sales minus variable cost and the fixed cost. Right? So we extended the costs. Okay? We extended the costs because we know the costs could be variable or could be fixed. But anyway, when we add this together, we still get the same total cost. Right? So in management accounting, in your higher accounting, this formula can be translated as sales minus the variable costs, we have contribution margin. So when we deduct variable costs from the sales, when you have here, we would actually get a contribution margin. Okay? A contribution margin is something that you'd earn after you deduct variable costs from the sales. And when we deduct fixed costs from the contribution margin, you would get sales. So it's actually the same. The formula is actually the same. It's just the presentation. No, So this formula can be presented in this way. And when we deduct a variable cost from the sales, we would get contribution margin. Okay? So that is contribution margin. When I say contribution margin, this is a measure of the ability of the company to recover variable cost with the revenue. So since as we as we have learned that variable cost varies, it uh, it varies on the production level at the same time on the on the sales. So when you sell more, you would also incur more variable cost, right? For example, in this uh, example before, if I would sell one of these, I would get a revenue or a sale of 150. And then, if I sell two of these, I'd get a revenue of 300. Okay, so while the sales is increasing, the variable cost is also increasing, right? Because it's variable. So when we sell more, this now becomes the ability of the company to recover the variable cost with that particular revenue. Okay, so let's try this example. Mark sells cochinta for 7 pesos. You know what's cochinta? I think it's rice cake. It's made up of glutinous rice. Anyway, I don't know really what's the English for cochinta. So each cochinta requires a total variable cost of 3.70 variable cost and a fixed cost of per week of 720. How much the profit if Mark sells 400 pieces cochinta in a week 
Okay, so we're given the price, 7 pesos. We're also given variable cost, 3.70. And we're also given 7.20 fixed cost. So how much Mark would earn if he would sell 400? So our solution would be, we have a sales. That is 7 pesos times 400. And we get 2,800 pesos less the variable cost. And that is 3.70 times 400 we get 1480 then we get contribution margin of 1320 and then from contribution margin we deduct the fixed cost of 720 therefore mark had a profit or we had a profit of 600 pesos for selling 400 pieces of cochinta in a week okay <clears throat> So, how about if Mark sells Cochinta for 7 pesos each? However, Mark only sells 200 pieces. So, we have the same problem, but here, Mark sells 200 pieces only. So, our solution would be, uh, we have sales, 1, 4, that's 7 pesos times 200. And then less variable cost, that is 3.70 times 200. And then we get contribution margin of 660. At this point, we will know, oh, there's only 660 contribution margin. And we get a fixed cost of 720. Therefore, we'd had a loss of 60 pesos. Right? So, we need to say, when Mark sells 400, he would earn something. But if when Mark sells 200 pieces only, he would have a loss. Okay, so how many pieces should Mark sell to earn zero profit? And how many pieces should Mark sell to start earning profit? That's a question, right? Because if you are Mark, you would actually be interested in knowing how many pieces should I sell to recover all these costs to get zero profit. And how many pieces should I sell to start earning profit? Right? That's a very good question. So, now let's go to break-even concept. Okay? How many units have to be sold to at least recover the cost? Okay? And how many units have to be sold to start earning profit? Okay? So... That is actually the basic notion of break even. To break even. Break even. Meaning, how many units should I sell to make my revenue equals to my costs? To get zero profit. Break even. So, again, let's go to our formula. We have the profit is equal to sales minus the variable cost and the fixed cost, okay? We have extended this. So, this um, formula could be further extended. It can be further expanded by having this profit is equal to the price per unit times the unit sold. So, actually, this, this one made up our sales, right? right and when i say variable cost this actually can be expanded into the variable cost per unit times the unit sold this is the variable costs okay and we have the fixed costs so there we have already expanded our formula so let us say in mathematical way we have x is equal to p, the price, times the u, the units, minus variable cost, or vc, times the u, minus fixed cost, or fc. So we have a more simpler, a simpler formula. So if the profit is zero, how many units have to be sold to at least recover the costs? That is a break-even question. This question may be resolved 
using the formula given x is 0. So remember that in our previous slide, we have already determined that the x is the profit is equal to the price of the good, then times the unit sold, minus the variable cost times the unit sold, minus fixed cost. So if the profit is 0, then we would get this. Okay? <clears throat> so P times U minus VC times U minus fixed cost. So the question is how many units have to be sold? So we can combine the PU, the, this one, this term, and then this term. Since they have common um, factor, we have the U here and U here. So we can... Um, we can, you know, take this U outside and then open parenthesis, P minus VC minus FC, okay? Okay, so we'll have to transpose this, okay? And then to divide this by, you know, profits minus VC, so we get the units is equal to fixed cost, over the price minus the variable cost per unit. So this is now our formula. Okay, here is now our formula to compute how many units have to be sold in order to have a zero profit. Okay? <clears throat> so the units, for us to compute how many units have to be sold to have a zero profit, this is now our formula. The fixed cost divided by the price per unit minus the variable cost per unit. Okay? So example, Tina sells donuts for 20 pesos each. For every 20 donuts made, Tina spent 80 pesos for the flour, 30 pesos for the sugar, 35 pesos for the milk, milk, 15 pesos for the eggs, and then 5 pesos for the yeast, and Tina pays 120 for the labor for every 20 donuts made. Gas usage is estimated to be 30 pesos for every 20 donuts made, while the monthly appreciation of the equipment and utensils is fixed at 1,275, regardless of the donuts sold or produced. So there are many given um, things here, and we need to compartmentalize on how to solve this problem. So how many donuts must be sold in a month? to at least recover all costs and at what number of donuts sold should Tina start earning. Okay, so we have there given, we are given selling price 20 pesos per donut and then for every 20 donuts made, Tina would need a flour, which is 80 pesos, a sugar, 30 pesos, a milk, 35 pesos, the eggs, 15 pesos, the yeast, 5 pesos, and of course, labor, 120 pesos. So this, also the gas, it's 30 pesos. We also have depreciation of the equipment, and that is 1,275. So take note that these ingredients are the total sum for every 20 donuts made okay while well, this depreciation is fixed per month this is our okay so these are direct materials this 80 until the yeast until yeast and we have the labor direct labor and we have the gas which and depreciation which are the overhead so take note that the gas is a variable overhead while depreciation is a fixed overhead. So this first step is to compute the variable cost per unit. We have direct materials per unit, flour, sugar, milk, eggs, yeast, a total of 165. Okay, divided by 20 units, we have a yield of 8.25. So this is now the direct materials per unit sold, or per unit, okay? 
Because again, these things is for the entire 20 units. We also have direct labor. That is 120 divided by 20 units equals 6 pesos per uh, a unit of donut. And we have the variable overhead per unit of the gas divided by 20 units. We have 1.5. So combining this together, we have direct materials, 8.25, we have labor, we have overhead, and, you know, combining this together, we would get the variable cost per unit. And that is a total of 15 pesos, 0.75 centavos. So this is now the cost, the variable cost per unit. And now let's have the fixed cost. There's only one, and that is the depreciation per month, which amounts to 1275 So step three, use the formula and solve the break-even sales. So we have the break-even units. If you can still remember, that's U is equal to fixed cost over the price per unit minus the variable cost per unit. So we have here, 1,275 divided by 20, that's the price per unit per donut, minus 15.75. We get 300 donuts. So Tina must produce and sell 300 donuts to recover all costs and earn no profit. So let us check whether we got the correct answer. So we have here the profit. Let's go back to our formula. Okay. So we have here the profit is equal to 20 pesos price per unit times 300 units sold minus 15.75 times 300 units sold minus 1275. So we have 6,000 minus 4725 minus 1275. A total of zero. Zero profit. Yes, because this is the break-even sales or the break-even units. Meaning to say, when Tina sell this number of units, these 300 units, Tina would earn nothing, would earn zero. But also would lose zero. So it's a break-even. Tina has no profit, but he has also no loss. He just She just recovered the entire costs. Okay? So at break-even point of sales, Tina earns zero profit, but she has already recovered the cost, the fixed cost. This means that at sales beyond the break-even point, Tina will start earning profit. So meaning if Tina would sell 300 and earns zero profit, then if Tina would earn 301 units, then Tina would earn the profit, right? Because at 300 point or 300 units, Z uh, Tina has already recovered all the costs. Therefore, for every unit in excess of that break-even point, Tina would earn a profit, Okay. So if Tina sold 299 donuts, that's one donut short. So we'd get unit, again, same formula. We have here 20 times 299 and so on. We have 580. So if Tina would sell 299 donuts, then she would have a loss of 4.25. 4.25. That is actually the difference between the price and the variable cost, right? Hmm. So at sales lesser than the break-even point, Tina will incur loss equivalent to the number of units short of the break-even times the contribution margin. So recall that we have discussed the contribution margin. That is the price minus the variable cost per unit. So when we deduct the variable cost per unit from the price, we would get a contribution margin. So for every unit sold below the break-even point, Tina would have a loss. So if Tina would sell $2.99, then he would incur a loss 
of 4.25. That's one contribution margin. That's 20 minus 15.75. So if Tina would sell 299 donuts, he would have a, she would have a loss of four uh, 8.50. That's 4.25 times 2 because she's two units be, uh, below the break-even point. How about if Tina would sell higher than the break-even point? So assume let's uh, Tina sold 301 donuts. So again, let's go back to our formula. So that's 20 times 301. So Tina would earn a profit of 4.25. And that, again, is the contribution margin. That is the price, the 20 pesos, minus the variable cost, the 15.75. So for every unit sold beyond the break-even point, Tina would earn a profit equivalent to the uh, contribution margin times the unit sold in excess. So if Tina would sell, again, the break-even point was 300. If Tina would sell 301, then Tina would earn 4.25. If Tina would sell 302, then he would earn 8.50. That's 2 times 4.25. If Tina would sell 3 or 303 donuts, then she would earn, that's 12.75, right? So you just multiply the excess number, the excess number of donut, uh, are beyond the break-even point times the contribution margin. So conclusion, Tina should at least sell 300 donuts to, to break even, meaning to earn zero, to have no profit and have no loss, meaning to recover the fixed cost. And if she wants to earn profit, she should sell beyond 300 donuts. Okay, so the important thing here in business is that you focus on the cost, okay? You focus on the variable cost and the fixed cost. Because once you have recovered the fixed cost or contribution margin, then you would start earning profit beyond, um, you know, your no, no, normal profit. So that's the point in the business. You have first to recover the fixed cost before you actually start earning profit. Okay, so thank you for watching and I hope you learn a lot from this 